sunshines. It is good to see you today. Thanks for being here. Hey, if you didn't uh, remember to grab your communion supplies in, I think Caleb Scott has those and is ready to deliver those. Raise your hand if you need communion supplies. All right, I don't see anybody. If you didn't want to raise your hand and you want somebody to deliver those there in the foyer, you can go grab those real quick. I don't have a whole lot to share with you. First, I got to brag on Penny for just a second. Uh, you guys know how much work Penny does around the church for us. Uh, she's so good. She was here at the building last night. She likes to wait till Saturday night to print the bulletin so that there's fewer things that need to be changed. So she came up last night about 10 o'clock and printed the bulletin for you. But while she was here, she smelled uh, a lot of natural gas. And for some reason, our friends at Morrison and Fuson seem to think that's a bad condition to, to leave, leave in process. So she talked to uh, our other friends at the Greater Dixon Natural Gas uh, Authority, and they were here until a little after midnight last night repairing two gas leaks near the meter here. So um, anywho, this could have been a really exciting day, but uh, Penny, uh, Penny really took care of some good things. Uh, for us. I do have a couple of prayer requests to share with you. We need to remember Abel Shelburne's grandfather. He uh, spent a little bit of time in the hospital, mostly related to dehydration, uh, but he does still have a few tests that need to be run yet. Uh, let's remember Sandra Dudley in our prayers. She was visiting with us today back from uh, Colorado. She lost one of her friends and high school classmates suddenly uh, a couple of days ago, so she was in town for that funeral. And also, Will Bryant, after first service, asked me to mention Mike Morgan, who's been a longtime paramedic here in Dixon. Uh, he has uh, a pretty severe case of COVID, and they put him on a ventilator today and actually called in some of his family. So it sounds like it's a pretty severe situation. That's Mike Morgan we're asked to pray for. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Our groups have gotten started and are off to a really good start. If you haven't jumped in one, uh, there are plenty of options. There's always the group here at the building, too, Sundays at 5. Uh, I hope that you'll hop in and join one of those. There's two or three that meet tonight, another one or two tomorrow, I think. So lots of good places for you uh, to get involved. 
And also, if you want to get involved in another way, you're going to like this one. Joey's got a good opportunity for you. 4 p.m. tomorrow, show up at the building ready to help Joey mix and pour some concrete. Uh, so uh, if you know somebody who needs some cement shoes or you have a body you need to dispose of, tomorrow is the time. Uh, see Joey. They're going to uh, pour some concrete to fill in where some of the plumbing work was done and also uh, load up some stuff on a trailer to, to get it out of here. The good news also to that front uh, is that demolition work is scheduled to start Tuesday morning on the community center. So with any luck, there will be a hole there. We avoided a crater in one place, and we're going to put a hole somewhere else this week. So it's going to be a good week for us at the Burns Church. Okay, as we worship today, I hope you'll notice in our songs the theme of praise, God's glory, God's honor. Let's keep that in mind as we worship together. Please join me in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we gather this morning to worship and give you praise, and there's, there's so much to be thankful and to praise you for, and start off the praise for this beautiful day you've created in the pretty blue sky, and just your creation that you've given us, that you've, you've created with thought and design and intent, and we're so thankful for, for this creation, and, and Lord, I'm thankful and want to give you praise for this congregation and your church as a whole, uh, Lord, that there's so many great people here that, that love us and love me and that's been there for us, and uh, 
help us to, to be your hands and to be your feet as we go through life that uh, whatever opportunities or things that come our way that we can um, show Christ in, in everything we do um, with love and kindness and and Lord, right now, over the past you know couple years, especially, it just feels like this country's been more and more divided, and we can see it specifically, you know, in social media and so many other things. And stand in front of you, Lord, today, asking for forgiveness, and you know, because at times I forget, and I, I forget that that day when I was baptized, you know, and I received that Holy Spirit, that I chose purposely to be your disciple and and that day I took a vow to be to be different than the world and not in the world but instead of expecting the rest of the world to change and that your church that I need to be more like what Jesus showed us and through through the scriptures and that means listening truly listening to our our neighbors and you gave us a parable what a neighbor is and to try to understand what our neighbors actually may be going through and uh which you know help us explain you know maybe really what they feel and what they're thinking instead of just jumping to our con conclusions of what we think is right or what we feel um, so help me, Lord, be a better Christian and to be that light and to be that example that the world needs, not expect the world on its own to be that change. Be with us this morning as we gather, as we to worship you and give you praise. Let us do so with the most thankfulness in, in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. course facilitator for 10 years for Lion Adventure in Henderson, Tennessee. And as groups would come, we would meet first thing and talk about what we're going to be doing. I'd give them three parts of a contract that they had to agree to. 
before we could do anything for high ropes or for low ropes. The number one thing that we would start up for a contract was safety. We wanted to make sure that everyone would be safe, that they wouldn't get hurt. I'd go over how much the rope would hold, how much the steel cables would hold, your harness would hold, your helmet. We would also talk about the carabiners and the belay points, all those things to show that it was safe for you to do this. Secondly, was 100% participation. We wanted everyone to participate. Now, maybe somebody didn't want to climb up that 35-foot pamper pole and stand on a 12-foot top, a 12-inch top. But someone at the bottom could belay those people from the ground and make sure that they didn't fall. And then thirdly was watching each other's back. Communication. We had to know that we're watching you. We're watching your backs because, see, we had one harness that was hooked up from the back. And when you're up there, you cannot see that. So you would say, hey, is that thing hooked up? And everybody go, no, no. yes, it was. So they felt comfortable. And I tried to do spiritual application at the end, which would help. And I thought about, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we think of Jesus in the upper room and his 12 apostles. How did they feel? What did they have that connected them? Well, number one, what about safety? Well, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus personalizes his statements by using the pronoun you. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to suffer for them. He was going to die for them. True, Jesus would die for everyone, for the sin of the world. But his disciples heard Jesus say, I am doing this for you. He was making sure they were safe with eternal life. Secondly, 100% participation. When he was there, all the apostles were partaking of the Lord's Supper, even Judas. And then when in John, when he washed their feet, he even washed Judas' feet. Observing the Lord's Supper carries personal significance because Jesus calls us to remember that he gave his body for you. It also carries personal responsibility for us to participate with what? Reverence, humility, sincerity, and understanding, and proclaiming Christ's great act of love till he comes. And then thirdly, communication. To communicate, watching each other's back. Personal mail shows that someone has taken time to communicate with us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives instruction concerning the words of the Lord's Supper and in going to reminds the Corinthian Christians of two things. Their personal salvation in Christ and their participation and the supper carries inward and outward aspects. Emerly participants were to examine themselves spiritually of the supper in verses 27 and 28, and then outwardly participants proclaimed through the supper of the Lord's death until he returns. People have many ideas about who Jesus is and why he came to earth. Jesus said himself that he came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10. When we gather around the Lord's table, the elements speak to us of his sacrifice, of his salvation, and of our salvation. We celebrate our redemption in remembrance of him. Let's bow together. Father, we thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to remember your son, for the death on the cross, for his body, spiritually broken for us. May we take this bread in a manner that is well-pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us now pray for the cup. Father, we thank you so much for the blood that was shed. For this fruit of the vine which represents that shed blood. May we take that in a manner well pleasing in thy sight. We thank you so much for your love. In Christ's name, amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, but we have another avenue, and that's to give, to give back what he's given to us. Because of what we've been doing, because of the pandemic, there is a basket in the back, and you can give that as you leave. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us everything, for showing us your word. In Christ's name, amen. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, and not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Roy, you think I say dumb things when I have prepared them? Can you imagine how bad it would be if I didn't? Amen. <laughs> And I have last week's notes if I get really desperate. So. Um, 
Let's try an experiment. Uh, who are my golfers? Jeffrey. Glenn. Caleb Scott. Let's see. Okay. Are you ready? Four! <laughs> now, I noticed that Jeffrey's wife hid, <laughs> and Jeffrey didn't flinch. I feel like that, that might need unpacking. You know, in first service, I think James Hinkle went like this because he was hoping he'd get a free golf ball. Uh, he, he is that cheap, okay? Uh, you know, I've always thought it's kind of funny. It seems like by the time someone yells that, you don't really have a whole lot of time to do anything. Uh, the times my brother and I played golf, you know, sometimes I'd hit one of those beautiful shots that went about 10 feet off the tee pad and he would yell four just to be facetious, you know, thanks, you know, some poor worm lost his life in that shot. It's funny how we, we yell that and we yell sometimes, we yell heads up, right, when we know something's headed towards someone. That always seemed to me maybe the worst possible thing you could yell uh, because really what we should probably yell is duck and cover <laughs> because uh, by the time you get your heads up, it's too late, you're going to get hit by something. I don't know if you saw in the news this week. But Google announced a new feature for their Pixel phones. Did you hear about this? It's part of their digital well-being app, which is supposed to minimize the danger to your life of smartphones. You know what this thing does? It activates a sensor in your phone. If it can tell that you're walking around and you're outside of your house and you're using your phone, and if the phone is being held at an angle that's fairly flat, kind of like this, as opposed to something like this, it puts a big warning message on your screen that says, look up. And they had to do this because there has been such an increase of injuries of people who are walking down the road, looking at their phone, stepping into traffic and getting hit by a bus. Or, I guess I shouldn't laugh at that, that's not really funny, it's just funny when you see the YouTube videos of it, or the people who are walking down the road, they're staring at their phone, and they run into a telephone pole. Now, those you can laugh at and still be a Christian. Uh, they had to put this warning in a phone that says, look up. I think that's kind of interesting. You ever go to a restaurant, and you see an entire table full of people who are all on their phones? They've gone out together somewhere, but every single one of them is, is looking and scrolling. I'm really surprised none of you have texted me while I'm doing this. That's really what I was kind of expecting. I don't know which is worse, when you go out to a restaurant and you see an entire family doing it, or when you go out to a restaurant and there's a couple that are obviously out on a date and they're not talking to each other. But for some people, that might help. I'm not real sure. But we have this, uh, this thing where we just, we get absorbed in these devices and we don't ever look up. Today's lesson is really simple. It's the text on the screen behind me. It's Colossians 3. I want to read it for you again. If then you have been raised with Christ... This is a passage that's for Christians. If you are a Christian, this is a message you need to hear. If you're not a Christian, this message is not going to help you any, so you can just tune on out. But if you're a Christian, this is a message you need to hear. One, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Two, set your minds on things that are above, not on things of the earth. For you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If I were going to summarize this little paragraph in just a couple of words I might say four I might say heads up or maybe I'd just say look up you know we spend a lot of time in our life looking at all sorts of things but I think maybe we don't always look at the right things can I can I make a confession to you when uh, Leslie and I go to Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg or the Smokies um, there's something that absolutely drives me crazy you've gone to the Smokies and you walk around and you see everybody doing this Looking at this, you're next to the Smokies, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. They're beautiful, but what are you looking at? Facebook. <laughs> or it just baffles me. When you go to, the, the, to Pigeon Forge, uh, what do you do? You spend all of your time going to the As Seen on TV store to buy junk from China. When you've come to the place where you can get that on Amazon any day of the week, right here in Dixon. But you've gone to the Great Smoky Mountains, and what do you do? You go to the junk store. You, you go buy some cast iron that's expensive. You go buy junk that you don't need. What do you do when you go there? You go look at a Ferris wheel in Paula Deen's restaurant. When you're there, it's this beauty of God's creation. But you know what I just confess to you? I'm not looking at the mountains either. What am I doing? I'm looking at you, not looking at the mountains. <laughs> we all have these different things that we do. 
that we look in the wrong place. If we're not careful, we spend an awful lot of our lives not looking up like the text calls us to, but looking down, looking down on the people around us, comparing ourselves to other people, judging other people. My old dead friend C.S. Lewis said, in God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you are proud, you cannot know God. A proud man, listen to this part, a proud man is always looking down on things and down on people. And of course, as long as you are looking down, you cannot see something that's above you. One of the reasons we have trouble seeing God is because we're too busy looking down on people. We sit around talking about what's wrong with the world or wrong with our neighbors or what's bad about our governments or bad about our friends or bad about our schools. And we see all of this stuff. We spend all this time looking down. We miss God. One of the easiest ways to miss God is to spend our lives looking down. You remember that time that Jesus in Matthew 7 warned about our ability to look at the wrong things? You remember that time he talked about how you, uh, you see uh, the, the speck in your brother's eye when you got a two by four out of your own eye? Uh, Joey would say, you know, there's a two by four. Those are worth a whole lot right now. You should pay attention to that one first. But there's this tendency that we have to look into other people, to look down, to judge, to compare. And it's all over scripture. <laughs> Do you remember that time in Matthew 20, verse 20, uh, when the mother of the sons of Zebedee, yeah, James and John's mom, shows up to Jesus? you remember this story? And the first thing that she does when she gets to Jesus is she says, hey, I want to make sure my boys are number one and number two in your kingdom. I want to know who's going to sit at your right hand and who's going to sit at your left. Now, do you hear what she's done? She's looking out for her kids and she's trying to jockey for position for them. She's trying to make sure that they have the best spot. She's standing in front of Jesus and she entirely misses the point. Do you remember when Peter did that? It's the Mount of Transfiguration, right? There is Jesus and there's what Moses and there's Elijah, two guys who've been dead for a thousand years show up. And what does Peter want to talk about? He wants to talk about making tents for them. Guys, if they could be back from the dead from a thousand years, tents are the least of their concern. But he's, he's looking down at stuff that's not important. He's, he's, just, he, he's looking in the wrong place. If you read the book of Acts, Peter and Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they all get tangled up in this. They all get sucked into this vortex of looking down. It's so easy for us to do. Sometimes at church, we do it. She doesn't raise her kids right. He doesn't come to church enough. He talks too much. She talks too little. We find all of these ways to look down. And what's really, what's really frustrating about us is sometimes we find ways of justifying and rationaling our behavior. Well, I know Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. But he also says, by a, by a tree's fruit, you'll know it. A good tree doesn't bear bad fruit and a bad tree doesn't bear good fruit. I'm not judging people. I'm just inspecting fruit. And what's cute is that can be true. It's a legitimate thing in scripture, but it's also true that a lot of times I'm just trying to relabel what I was doing to make myself feel better about it when what I'm doing is focusing on you. Instead of listening to our text, set your mind on things above. Focus on the heavenly. Lewis said, pride leads to every vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. You can't see up when you're too busy looking down. Forgive me for continuing to quote my old dead friend, but there's a great test for this where we can see it in ourselves. He said, whenever we find that our religious life is making us feel that we are good, above all, that we are better than someone else, I think we may be sure that we are being acted on not by God, but by the devil. The real test of being in the presence of God is that you either forget about yourself altogether or you see yourself as a small, dirty object. It's better to forget about yourself altogether. The answer is, look up. We ought to be paying more attention to Jesus than to anyone, to anything else. But looking down on others isn't the only way that we miss this idea in Colossians 3, though. You ever walk into a room and see somebody just kind of In fact, some of you are doing that right now. It's the stage that happens right before you fall asleep. I, I understand that. Look, I get it every week. You ever see somebody who's just stared off into space? Their mind is either totally engaged with anything or it is totally in neutral and it ain't going anywhere. You're just zoned. You're not there. Our text in Colossians says, set your mind on things above. Think about things. Engage your brain. You remember those old Ronco infomercials for the rotisserie? Do you remember what I'm talking about? 
Probably Dennis is the only one old enough to remember that. Set it and forget it. You remember those things? Now, it's such a nice idea that you could do that, but things in life generally don't work that way. You can't just set your mind once and forget it. That's why the text is calling us to this idea. Keep on keeping on. Keep on concentrating. Keep on looking above because there is a gravity to this world that pulls your gaze lower. There's something about time that makes us aim our sights a little bit lower. When our minds wander, Sometimes we need the discipline to put them on a leash. One of our hymns has this great line, Let thy goodness like a fetter, like like a ball and chain, bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take it and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. We We are so easy to distract. Okay, how many of you walked into a room in the last day and then didn't remember what you were there for? That's all right. That's not just an age thing, by the way. That happens to everybody. It's so easy for us to, do you ever start to tell a story and then midway through it, you just kind of start to trail off and, where was I again? And what's really embarrassing is when the person who you're talking to doesn't know where you are either because they also zoned out three minutes before. You you didn't just lose your train of thought, it derailed and went off a cliff is what happened. But we do that so much even with our life of faith. The scripture calls us to set our mind on things above to keep on setting our mind that way if we don't set our things mind on things above we we pay attention to the immediate to the to the urgent to the things that seem really important right now but i'll tell you every day of the week something new seems important seems urgent every day of the week there's a new crisis on the news there's there's a new problem there's 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 once coronavirus is over there's going to be whatever's after coronavirus that we're worried about. Once that's over, there's going to be something new. There is always trouble in life on this planet. There's always something. And if you set your life by the newspaper, you're going to set your life by panic. But if you set your mind on things above, you'll have constancy. You you get that idea in Ephesians 4, by the way. It says in verse 14 uh, that we are no longer carried, no longer children tossed to and fro by, by the waves and carried about by deceitful winds of doctrine, by human cunning, But instead, verse 15, you've heard this verse before, rather, speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him, into Christ, into the one who is the head in every way. The Mary and Martha story is a story of distraction. The parable of the sower in the soils is a story of distraction. You remember how the thorns represented someone who who had faith that sprouted but then was taken away by the cares of the world? You remember that in that line? That's a thing that happens to us. So it's not good for us to look down on people, but it's also not enough for us just not to look down. We need to to have some some gaze somewhere, but the next place that people tend to gaze isn't really good either. Sometimes we're not looking down at other people, we're not sparing off into space, but we do something that's just as bad. We just, we stare at ourselves. We live life looking in the mirror, obsessed with self. And this this self-obsession can take a whole bunch of different forms. One time, we were on a flight. I don't even remember where we were going. I remember I was with Leslie. There was this girl who was sitting next to me. It was a two and a half hour flight. She spent the entire flight, no joke, the entire flight with her phone on selfie mode, camera mode, you know. She was using her phone as a mirror. She worked on her makeup for two and a half hours. The entire flight she worked on it. Now, I wanted to make the joke right here and say she was ugly at the beginning and she was ugly at the end. It didn't help, but she was fine the whole way. She was really an attractive lady the whole way, but the entire time she sat there I kind of wondered what she was on on the flight for. Was there some date she was really excited to make when she got there? I I don't know what the story was, but the entire time, that's what she did. And I couldn't help but feel a little sorry for her. But shoot, there I am again. I'm violating the first thing I talked about today. What was I doing? I was staring at someone else the whole time. Ah, it's so easy for us to do. But we have this tendency, if we're not looking at others and we're not staring off into space, we, we belly gaze. We obsess over ourselves. Can I tell you, a lot of people do this religiously. They come to church and they want to give you their resume and tell you how good they are and how lucky Jesus is to have them. Now, they never say it that way, but sometimes you you hear it. Shucks, sometimes you hear it at a funeral as it's almost like we're trying to prove that we were really good enough to fit. You know, I taught Sunday school for 47 years, and that was just one weekend with the third graders. I did all of these things. I gave money. I served. I taught. I poured concrete with Joey. I got all the heaven points. That misses the point entirely, doesn't it? Of course, there's the opposite version of the same error. 
Or we come to church and the entire time we're worried, I'm not as good. I don't know as many verses as Glenn. I'm not as nice as James. I can't sing as well as Eric. I don't know if I've got anything to have to offer. But both of those errors are the same error because they're coming to Jesus and instead of setting our mind on things above, our life being hid with him, what are we doing? We're looking at ourselves. We're paying attention to ourselves. To both of those mistakes, Jesus says, look at me, pay attention to me. It's so easy for us to do. Let me close this way. Why do you think worship is so important? It's a, it's a question I don't hear answered too terribly well. Why is it that, uh, that Jesus made such a habit of being at the temple or the synagogue? Why was it that Daniel prayed publicly and openly even when it might cost him his life? Why was it that we spent a lot of time and energy trying to figure out how we could worship even virtually during pandemic? Why is worship so important? And there are a lot of things worship isn't, okay? Worship is not our time to kiss up to God. It's not, it's not trying to convince him to like us. It's not divine bribery. That's not what worship is. If you're here today because you think that if you worship, maybe God will like you a little bit more, you have missed so much about God, and I'm so sorry, and I hope that we can help you, but that's not what you're doing today. You're not enriching God God isn't getting any more powerful because of the number of worshipers he has. It's just like when your kids make you macaroni art for your birthday. It's not exactly like you're really getting something that's going to, you know, you're not going to retire by selling that to the Louvre. That's not how it's going to work. We're not enriching God in any way. We're not bribing him. We're not making him like us more. Why in the world are we worshiping? This may be a really silly way of saying it. I think that the reason we worship is so that we have a reason to look up. It's a reminder each week to look up, not to look in, not to stare off into nothingness, not to look down, but it's a call to look up. Because every time we sing one of these songs, praise the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, he's our rock, he's our fortress, he's our deliverer, in him will I trust. The words coming out of my mouth are an affirmation and a reminder, Matthew, he is your rock, he is your fortress, he is your deliverer, and in him you will trust. That's in contrast, in contradiction to what my heart tends to think. I tend to think it's my job to be the rock, the fortress, the deliverer. I think it's my job. I think it's my job for me. I think it's my job for my family. I think it's even my job when I preach. That's the temptation that I have to share with you. But what, when I sing those words, I'm doing is saying that salvation belongs to God and to him be glory and honor forever and ever. They don't belong to me. They don't belong to you. It's not about my resume. And so I don't need to spend my life looking down on you. I need to spend my life looking up. There's a really cool thing. If you've ever driven through the Great Smokies and you see a whole bunch of people on the side of the road and they're all looking the same direction, you know what you're going to see? A Chick-fil-A. No, of course it's not. (laughs) You know what you're going to see? you're going to see a bear. Because when there's a whole bunch of people on the side of the road at Cades Cove looking in the same direction, there's something worth seeing, right? What's supposed to happen on Sunday at church? A whole bunch of people have gathered in the same place to look the same direction. That direction, by the way, is not at me. (laughs) It's not at Eric. It's not at the elders. That direction is to look up. And the hope is, as we teach each other to look up, it makes it a little bit easier for us not to look down, not to stare off into space, and it makes it a little bit easier for someone else to say, hey, I need to see that too. This week, I don't know where you're looking, but I think I and I think all of us need a moment to recenter, to adjust our vision just a little bit. It's so easy for us to feel smug and proud and look down on others. Like Lewis says, pride is that complete anti-God state of mind. It's impossible to see what's above you if you're looking down. So this morning as we worship, let this be a moment to recalibrate your heart and look up and see the goodness of God in your life. Let's stand and sing an invitation song. Worthy of praises, Christ our Redeemer, worthy of
Everyone has a good week this week. Uh, let's remember those that were mentioned earlier as needing our prayers. Let them know that God is there for them. Let them know that we are there for them too if they need us. So let's be dismissed with a prayer and we'll have our closing song. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather here as your family. We pray that this has been an encouragement to us and that we can take what we've heard here today and we can go out through the world and let people know that we truly believe in the things that you want us to do and you would have us to do. Help us to be your hands and your feet through this community and around the world. Watch over each and every one of us as we leave here today. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. Be pleasing, oh God, oh God.